I know where you live. I know where you live. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So good to see everyone that is back out um, on this afternoon. I know that we began some. We didn't have service on last Sunday afternoon, but we know the week before that, we started doing something. Um, I did, um, and um, we asked the question, why was it important for us to study the Old Testament? And I told you that we would spend probably the remainder of the year going through the entirety of the Old Testament. Um, so I, well, we're starting off in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 1. You ain't even got to flip in your Bible for this. You, this was the first thing you learned, I hope, other than Jesus wept. <laughs> amen, amen. And it says simply that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, this book of Genesis is God's book of beginnings. It was written by Moses while he was in the wilderness, and it covers the history of the Old Testament, which goes from about 4000 B.C. up until 1700 B.C. And this first book found in our Bibles is very important because it is the foundation upon which all future revelation would be able to rest upon. And it is the only reliable book that have that teaches us the origin of the heavens. How did the heavens get there? It is the only book that gives us not only the origin of the heavens, but the origin of the earth. How did the earth get here? And not only does it give us the origin of the heavens and the origin of the earth, but it gives us the origin of mankind, even itself, even us. It tells us where we came from. And while the book of Genesis records the history of the origin of the universe, it mainly records the history of one family, one race, one nation. And the main theme of the book of Genesis is that man Man is in need of redemption from his sins. That's the main idea. And I don't know about you, but I'm in need of redemption even on the day. And that, that is so true. So let's begin our lesson by looking at, we're going to do a brief overview and we're going to hit several scriptures that we go through. And I'm sure we will not finish this lesson on the day. We'll probably have to continue this on next week. But just by looking at chapters 1 through 5 of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1, as we read, says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now from this very first verse that's in the Bible. We learn about God and that he created everything in six days and he rested on the seventh. Now look at verse number 27 and see what he says about mankind. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now I know this is going to be unpopular. But I got to say it. I'm not, you know, throwing shot, not throwing a rock at anybody. I just got to say it because we live in a society now where, you know, it used to be just people chose to date the same sex. And that was their choice. That was your choice. That's a decision that they made. But now people are making the choice to change themselves from a man into a woman. And then you have people that, and they actually have procedures, surgeries for this stuff. Foundations that are funding the surgeries for these people to go and to change their whole identity into something that they were not created to be. But can I tell you, you may change your name from Charles to Sheila. When you stand before God, you're going to be Charles. <laughs> when you stand before God, you're going to be exactly what it is that God created you as. Don't get mad at me. That's in the word of God. And I say what Paul said, have I become your enemy simply because I tell you the truth. Now, at this point in Genesis, Adam and Eve were without sin. And they were pleasing to God. And of course, we all know that did not last long because in the key chapters of Genesis, our first major event since the world, since the creation in Genesis chapter three, we learn about the fall of man. Man, they could even make it five chapters from chapter one to verse chapter three. We find the fall of man and God gave Adam and Eve one restriction. We know not to eat of the tree of the knowledge, but the serpent talked Eve into eating from the tree and she gave it to Adam and their eyes were open and they were of the nakedness. And because of their disobedience, they were kicked out of the garden of Eden, but God still provided them with some clothing. Even after God whip you, he'll still bless you. That's the kind of God that we serve. And in the same chapter of man's fall, 
from sin, we get a first glimpse into God's plan to restore man back into favor. And I told you some two weeks ago that I was going to show you in every book of the Old Testament that it mentions Jesus in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Now, let's look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. Genesis chapter 3. Verses 14 to 15, it says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, verse number 15 is our first prophecy about Jesus Christ. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15, that's the first glimpse that we get of the coming Christ. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 20 tells us that this plan was in place before the world was ever created or before the world was ever formed. And in chapter 4, we learn about, y'all know Cain and Abel, the bad brothers, and, and how Cain commits the first murder recorded and he thought that he could get away with it, but God sees all, y'all know that right, and God knows knows all and so God punishes Cain and he puts a mark on him and you know that the lineage of Jesus Christ himself would have gone through Abel but since he killed his brother it came through another and that was Seth in Genesis chapter 4 and verse number 25 and we learn from these four chapters that we just read number one God is the creator of all things there was nothing made that God did not have a hand in it Nothing poof and just came into existence. God had a hand in all of that happening. So not only do we learn that God created all things, number two, even though mankind sinned, God still put a plan in motion to save us from our sin. And in that good news, you wasn't even thought of when Genesis was around, but guess what? God still had you on his mind because he created a way for us to come back to him. And then number three, there are consequences to pay when you disobey the word of God. Amen. Somebody didn't believe that. I said that there are consequences to pay when you disobey the word of God. That's number three. And then number four, you can't get away. You can't get away anything because God sees everything. Now, chapter six through 11, it is here that we come to the next major event, and that is the great flood that we read about in the Bible. And as man began to multiply, so did sin. As man began to multiply, so did sin began to multiply. And the sin of mankind had gotten so bad that God said in Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 6, it says, and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. Man, they sure had enough had to be showing out back then. They showed up, had to be doing something, anything. And it grieved him in his heart that he had even made mankind. And at this point, God was ready to wipe them off the face of the earth. He was ready to do away with them. But one man and his family stood out because they served God. And let me tell you, I don't care if everybody around you is acting a fool. You and your family can be those ones that serve God. Just because everybody else is leaving God, you stay with God. You can be that one that makes a difference for somebody else. And we know that God instructs Noah to build an ark and he tells him how to make it. Now, he didn't just tell Noah to go out there and build an ark because no, he might have went looking for some timber. He might have went looking for some sweet gum or some kind of other tree. But he told him, he said, go and find some gopher wood. And we know Noah obeyed God's instruction and it took him over a hundred years to build one boat. When Noah finishes and all the animals are all loaded on the ark, God instructs Noah's family to get on board as well. And the door is closed and the rain begins for 40 days and for 40 nights, just like God had promised them that it would be. And all life that was on the earth, all life that was on the ground was destroyed and only eight souls were saved because they obeyed the word of the Lord. And once the flood waters receded once again, the earth had only righteous people but God gave the command for them to be fruitful and multiply and once again as mankind multiplied 
so did sin. Which brings us to the next great event, which is the scattering of the nations. In Genesis chapter 11, we learn that mankind has now moved to one place and one language and one goal. Their goal was to build a tower that reached the heavens because they wanted to show how great they were. God was not part of their lives. They only looked to themselves. And when God looked down on mankind and their prideful selves, he confused their language, which caused them to scatter over all the face of the earth, separating mankind into multiple nations. Four lessons we get from Genesis chapter 6 of um, number 11. And number one, that is, sin makes God grieve in his heart. Sin does that. Sin makes God grieve in his heart. Because I'm just sure he's just up there thinking, now man, I'm sure you know I hung on a cross. I'm sure you know I shed my very blood for the remission of your sin. So every time you go back into that, all you're doing is taking me right back to the cross. So number one, sin makes God grieve in his heart. And number two, when God speaks, you ought to listen. Don't go and get no second opinion based off what God has said. Don't go and try to consult on well, what you think I ought to do. God said I ought to do this. God when God tells us to do something, we ought to do what it is that God has said. And then number three, God saves those that obey. If Noah and his family would have been unbelievers and had not believed the word of God and would have just been sitting around waiting, twiddling their thumb, oh, I guess ain't no rain come, come, been 10 years, I still ain't seen no rain. I just could imagine what would have happened to them. They would have been destroyed just like everybody else. But because they obeyed the word of God, he and his family, they will say. That's number three. Then number four from Genesis chapter 6 to 11, we learn that being prideful is not pleasing to God. It's not pleasing to God at all. So in the remaining chapters of Genesis, in closing, we learn about four great men. Number one, that was Abraham. Y'all remember Abraham, don't you? He had faith in God and he trusted God. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse number one, I'm going down to verse number four, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I'm going to show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you and I will curse those that curse you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Y'all know that had to be some faith. I'm not talking about nobody just came out of high school. Nobody that just came out of college. I'm talking about a man that's well into his old age and he was willing to follow the voice of God even at that old age. And even though he had no idea where he was going, he trusted that God was going to take care of him. He trusted that God was going to lead him to where it was that he wanted him to go. And then in Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 10, we learn about Abraham. He had a weakness. You got a weakness too. Don't talk about Abraham. Abraham had a lion spirit. He had a lion spirit. Now notice, and I want you to notice something. So, so, you'll, so you'll start thinking about this, and I want you to chew on it for a little while. Every great man that you read about in the Bible had a weakness. Except Jesus. Every man that you read about in the scripture, they had something that they dealt with, but they, God still used them for his good and for his glory. So can I say to you, even the day you may have made mistakes and choices in your life, and you may feel like because of the choices and the decisions that you have made that God can use you, God uses the ones that other people feel God cannot use. So... We learned that he had a weakness of lying. That was a famine in the land. So, you know, they sojourned down there to Egypt. And now Sarah, his wife, was very beautiful. She was a beautiful lady. And Abraham was afraid that Pharaoh was going to kill him and take her to be his own wife. So he decided to tell a lie that, oh, that's my sister. That ain't my wife. Sarah's my sister. And now this wasn't a complete lie because she was his half-sister. There was a different day and a different time that they were living in. But since he only told part of the story, it was still a lie. They did try to take Sarah, 
but they but their whole place suffered a plague and when they found out why they asked Abraham to leave and to take your wife with you Abraham didn't just lie once he lied twice Genesis chapter 20 and verse number 2 he tells the same lie to Abimelech the king of Gerar this goes to show that even the most faithful men can sin from time to time then in Genesis chapter 15, God makes a covenant with Abraham, which is known as the, and the, as the land promise. He promises him that his descendants will inherit a great deal of land. He also promises Abraham that he will bear a child. And in Genesis chapter 17, we learn the sign for the covenant was circumcision. And from this point forward, a male child was born, was circumcised on the eighth day after they were born. What's interesting is that after this covenant was made, God changed their names to Abraham and Sarah. After the covenant was made, he changed their name. Before Genesis 17, their names were Abram and Sarah. But after the covenant was made, God changed their names to Abraham and Sarah. And I think this is neat because whenever we are baptized into Christ, we go through a name change as well. We not only carry our birth name, but we got a new name, and that is Christian. In Genesis chapter 21, after Abraham was a hundred years old, old man, hundred years old, and Sarah was past the time of having a child, through God's help, they had a son named Isaac. I am sure that they had began to wonder if they would ever have a son. And you can just imagine how much they loved this child that they had. And in chapter 22, Abraham's faith really gets put to the test. Because God asked him to sacrifice the one thing that he had waited so long to get. What's amazing is Abraham ran away. No, somebody listen. Abraham obeyed God. What's amazing is that Abraham followed God. Abraham did not doubt. He did not question God, but he took his son to sacrifice him. And he was about to make fatal blow, and the angel of the Lord stopped him because he was obedient to the word of God. And in Genesis chapter 22 and verse number 18, it says, In your seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Why? Because you have obeyed my voice. Wasn't because of anything that you did per se, Abraham, but it's only because you obeyed what I told you to do. So we learn several things from Abraham about our Christian lives today. And first of all, we need to trust in God. We need to trust what it is that God has said and realize that even if you don't understand why he wants us to do certain things found in the word, you ought to do them knowing that it's going to work out for your good. Obedience is better. We also learn that even the most faithful men fall from time to time, but you can still be found righteous before God. How? By repenting and striving to do better. Finally, we learn that if you are obedient to God's will, you have favor in his sight. In chapter 23, Sarah dies, which brings us to our second great man. Who is that man? A man by the name of Isaac. Y'all remember Isaac? In chapter 24, Abraham helps his son find a wife because he did not want him to marry a Canaanite woman. So he sent his servant to his home country where he meets a girl by the name of Rebecca. He meets a girl by the name of Rebecca. And it was kind of strange how the servant was to know who the right woman was to be. He would ask her to give him a drink. And if she said, okay, and let me also give you a camel something to drink, then she would be the right woman. Rebecca did that very thing that he said that she would do. So Isaac and Rebecca, they got married. And in chapter 25, we learn that Abraham finds him a new wife and marries Keturah. And he has several more children, and then he dies. Isaac was a lot like his father. First of all, both of their wives were beautiful, and both of them had trouble conceiving. Isaac prayed to the Lord, and he opened Rebekah's womb, and she bore two sons by the name of Esau and Jacob. 
In chapter 26, we find out that Isaac has the same weakness about his father. He got a lying spirit. Apple didn't fall too far from the tree. A family comes along. And Isaac and his family go to the same king that his father did. Abimelech, king of Gerar. Isaac tells the king the same lie. That Rebekah was his sister. <laughs> Which brought about the same result as it did when his father lied. In chapter 26, um, in 27 through 36, we learn about the third great man. Who was that? By a man by the name of Jacob. Jacob. We will call him the scam artist. Yeah. We're we going to call him the schemer. That's what we're going to call him. Jacob's brother, whose name was Esau, was born first. So because he was born first, you know that he would have received his father's possessions. And at this point, Isaac was old and could not see. His eyesight had gotten bad. So he asked Esau, who was a hunter, to go and kill him some food to serve to him, and he would give him his blessing. Well, Rebecca heard this, and she got her son Jacob and told him to go and kill two young goats, and she cooked it up just like Isaac liked it, and she put some of Esau's clothes on Jacob. Now Esau was a very hairy man, so she also put the skin of the young goats on the arms of Jacob. And then Jacob went into his father's tent and lied to him. Everybody just lied. What's the problem? Telling him that he was Esau. It's a generational thing. My granddaddy was a liar. My daddy was a liar. So I'm going to be a liar. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing that lie just ran in the family. And since Isaac couldn't see, he rubbed Jacob's arm. And it smelled him just to make sure so Isaac blessed Jacob when he thought that he was blessing Esau. So with Jacob and Rebekah working together, they pulled out the biggest scheme that, that, that had happened to their time. And when Esau came back, it was too late. His birthright had been stolen from him, and he was ready to tear his brother limb from limb after he had did that. What's interesting is that God knew that this was going to happen. When did he knew what was going to happen while they were still in their mother's womb? Because back in Genesis chapter 25 and verse number 23, God said that the older shall serve the younger. This Bible is some y'all, I tell you. Look, can't nobody tell me that this is not the word of God. Because I don't just have to go to one place. I can go all throughout it and I can find this dot over here that's going to connect to this dot. And that dot going to connect to this dot. And that one going to connect to that. And after a while, you're going to see what God's plan is for mankind. And at this point, Jacob runs for his life. And ends up at his uncle Laban's house. His uncle Laban's place. And it is here that he meets the love of his life. A girl by the name of Rachel. And in chapter number 29. But now it's time for the scam artist to be scammed himself. Look, look, look. Ain't too fine when the rabbit got the gun. <laughs> in chapter 29 he gets scammed. He works a deal with his uncle. That he going to work for seven years in order to be able to have Rachel's hand in marriage. Seven years pass and Jacob thinks that he's getting Rachel. But to sneak his older daughter Leah in instead. He didn't learn until the morning that he had been tricked and he was now married to Leah. He had to work another seven years for Rachel. Fourteen years in total. He wanted her mighty bad, brother. Four, Fourteen years. Now, Jacob wasn't being very nice to Leah, so God blessed her with son after son while Rachel didn't bear any child. Finally, God opened Rachel's womb as well, and she gave birth to our final great man, whose name was Joseph. A few more interesting things about Jacob was, we know that he wrestled with God. We talked about that the Bible depicts that he wrestled with the angel. That angel was a theophanic representation of Christ. It was Christ presenting himself 
at that very moment. So he wrestled with God and God blessed him. And when he did that, he changed his name to Israel. Jacob and his brother Esau eventually worked things out. I would have snuck me one in on them just for old times, but, you know, they eventually worked things out. And one of the main things, the main things learned from Jacob is to be careful how you treat others. Others may treat you the very same way. <laughs> we read about Joseph lastly, and jo about Joseph, 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 we find about him in Genesis chapters 37 through 50. You read about the story of Joseph and you see that the providence of God at work in just about every book in the Bible, but you can really see it in the story of Joseph. You can really see it in the life of Joseph. How can you see that? We all know the story. Since Joseph was born of Rachel, Jacob showed favoritism. He showed favoritism. He showed favoritism in him and he made him a coat of many colors, which made his other brothers jealous of him. And to top it all off, Joseph went and started having these dreams. He went and started having these dreams. And then he come back to the, I have a dream. I have a dream. We got dreams too. What make your dreams so special? So he starts dreaming and he's telling these brothers and his father that he will be bowing, that they will be bowing down before him. So when Joseph went to check on his brothers one day, they decided to kill him. But the oldest brother by the name of Reuben would not let that happen. So they sold him into slavery instead. And next Joseph finds himself in Genesis chapter 39 as a slave in the house of Potiphar. Since God was with Joseph, everything he put his hands to prosper. Everything he worked out to do, it fulfilled the purpose that he wanted it to do. And since God was with Joseph, and now, y'all remember Potiphar's wife? Y'all remember her? Potiphar's wife tried to force Joseph to lie with her, but he refused and he ran out of the house and this landed him in prison. But God was still with him. And again, he was prospered even in prison. In Genesis chapter 40, Joseph inter interprets the dream of the baker and the butler. The butler is restored in three days and the baker dies in three days. Now Joseph asked the butler, hey man, when you get out of here, tell Pharaoh about me. Remember me. I helped you out. I want you to help me. I'll scratch your back. You scratch mine. I want you to remember me. But y'all know what happened. He forgot all about Joseph. So in Genesis chapter 41, he interpreted those dreams and, and he interpreted Pharaoh's dream and tells him that there's going to be seven years of plenty. And then after you have seven years of plenty, you're going to have seven years of famine. And when the seven years of famine began, Jacob's son went to Egypt to buy some grain. And Joseph accused them of being spies. Of course, they defended themselves and decided to test them. So he made them go back and bring Benjamin, which was his younger brother, which was Rachel's second child that she died giving birth to. And when they came back to, to with Joseph, he sends them away, but he plants some valuable things in the bag of Benjamin. Joseph was then stopped and tells them, whoever has stolen my valuables is going to become my slave. And of course, when they saw that Benjamin was the one Judah begged and Judah pleaded with Joseph to take him instead because he just knew if you take him, it's going to take my dad out of here. They didn't want to have to tell their father Jacob that they had to leave Benjamin behind because it would take him out. This made Joseph see that his brothers had changed. And it made him cry. And in Genesis chapter number 45, he reveals his true identity to his brothers. Man, could you imagine being there on that day? I know, I ain't confused about what y'all was trying to do to me. When y'all put me in that hole and y'all try, I ain't confused by a long shot. But as a matter of fact, I ain't mad at you because if it had not been for what you did, I wouldn't be where I am right now. He reveals himself. And then in Genesis chapter 45 and verse number four, and we'll see that how Joseph sees the providence of God. It says, and Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they drew near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, who you sold in Egypt. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. 
For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not who you who sent me here, but God. Y'all might have did the trickery, but it was really God working in the, in the behind the scenes. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. From a pit to a prison to a palace. What a story. From a pit. Man, am I going to get out of here? Out there scrubbing Pharaoh's floors with a toothbrush. I, I, I could imagine. I don't know they had toothbrushes back then. But, you know, uh, you know but out there scrubbing Pharaoh's floor, doing Pharaoh's chores. Man, look at how God blessed that man to go from being a slave to being the highest in command. Come on, man. Come on. Joshua learned a valuable lesson that we all need to learn as well. And that is that God is in control. He's in control. And even when we are at our lowest point, God is still working with us and working things out for the better. God does not forsake us, and he will take care of us if we remain obedient to him. Now, at the end of Genesis chapter 50, what happened? Joshua dies. We have come a long way in a short amount of time. As you can tell, we have a lot to look forward to. Even in this self, Genesis right here, we, we didn't, it, it would take us years to dissect uh, uh, scripture by scripture, chapter by chapter. But you see, we've just done a brief overview of the whole book of Genesis in 40 minutes. And we can see the plan of God all throughout, from the beginning until the end of it. And we can see even how Jesus himself is being set on the scene to make his appearance, even though his appearance won't happen until some seven, eight thousand years down the road. He was still being talked about before this happened. So let your people know, hey, man, we, I don't just serve a God that came about in the New Testament. He was spoken of and prophesied about even in the Old Testament. Even before there was somebody around to put pen to paper, he was still God all by himself. Amen. Before God ever created a man, before God ever created a woman to tell him how lovely he was, to tell him how glorious he was, he was still God all by himself. So we can see from the beginning God had a plan. We can see from the beginning that God had a purpose. We can see from the beginning that God desires to redeem man from their sins. He desires to redeem man from their sin. I gave you those examples. God did away with it. And even when it came to knowing them, when God wiped the earth and there was nobody left but the righteous. Then the righteous got off the boat and started acting a fool. <laughs> so even from the beginning, <laughs> we can see ourselves even from the beginning. Even from the beginning, people have been having trouble and God has been having to work with these individuals. And guess what? He's still working with us today. God is still molding. God is still shaping at each and every single one of us. And don't talk about Abraham. You have some Abraham moments yourself. Don't talk about Isaac. Guess what? You are Isaac some days. You wake up. Don't talk about Jacob. You can guess what? Someday you just like Jacob. <laughs> All of us have those moments. But just like these men, they have those moments. But ultimately, they were used for the greater purpose that God had called them. And can I tell you, you're going to have some mess ups. You're going to have some slips. You're going to have some falls in this life. But the blessing in that is not to remain where you are, but to get up and to continue the purpose of God for which he has called you into this world. Amen. Amen. Again, I want to thank all of you for being such an attentive listeners here on today. And maybe there's somebody in our midst here on this afternoon, maybe somebody that's, that's watching us today that is not a member of the body of Christ, which is the church of Christ. You do not share. And our religious conviction, we never close out a worship experience. We never close out a service without extending unto you the Lord's invitation. 
Um, this is the greatest invitation that you could ever receive in your life. And that is an invitation to give your life over fully to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to him by hearing his word, Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. So then faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. After you've heard it, believe the same. After belief, repent of your sins and confess Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Be buried with him in baptism. Have your sins washed away, done away with, never to rise before you in this life and night of the life that is to come. And the Lord himself will add you to his body. And praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord adds to the church daily, such as should be saved. Maybe you're here on this afternoon or maybe you're watching us and you're standing in the need of prayer. Let us know how we can pray for you. You have that opportunity to do that now. It's together we stand and sing the song of invitation there is one lord and one faith and 